It's wonderful to be back here with you. And thank you for your beautiful song. And my heart is completely broken open now. And I'm going to try to bring my um, brain and my heart <laughs> and my body all together and talk about this audacious message today, which is how to be happy for no reason. And I offer my gratitude to Dr. Bill Little and, um, and to Dr. Ed David also for uh, his warm introduction today and to you, this wonderful community here for welcoming me back. So how to be happy for no reason. Um, yesterday, I was finishing up leading a retreat at our center in San Jose and I left San Jose I uh, left the retreat early, left San Jose early to travel to Santa Cruz to attend a memorial service for someone who had passed in our family. And um, I, got, I got onto Highway 17 <laughs> on, on a beach day. <laughs> Highway 17 traffic was stopped. And so, you know, I went through that process of watching my thoughts watching my thoughts, watching my breath, change from you know, positive anticipation, faith, pleading, anxiety, <laughs> then mantra and prayer. And you know, <clears throat> literally, I was just stopped. And so you know, after all of that inside my head, I decided to just look out. And I looked in front of me. And wouldn't you know that the car in front of me had um, one of those license plate things, you know, where people have a message on there for you, and the message for me yesterday was, be happy. <laughs> so over time, you know, uh, I have noticed this risk of being a minister and a spiritual teacher. <laughs> Um, in which you put out something audacious like how to be happy for no reason. And then the universe, I don't think the universe tests us, but I think the universe unconditionally supports us, <laughs> right? And so it was like the universe saying to me, are you ready to talk about this tomorrow? <laughs> so two hours later, I did get to the memorial gathering before it was over, and I held to the affirmation, always in divine timing, and it did work out well. But that situation did remind me of <laughs> an earlier experience that we had with our two granddaughters, who were about six and eight years old at the time. And Highway 17 was implicated once again um, <laughs> as you know, dutiful grandparents. Um, we were taking the girls back home after a really fun day, you know, with the grandparents. And they were happily ensconced in their little car seats behind us in the back seat. And we got onto the highway, and there it was. Traffic stopped. And as we sat there, one of the little girls said from the back, I hate traffic. And so then the other little granddaughter said, yeah, I hate traffic. And so being the grandmother and the spiritual teacher that I am, I thought, oh, this is my moment. <laughs> this is a teaching moment. You know, like, where did a six-year-old and an eight-year-old get that? You know, it was just the car stopped. And so why was there this decision, this thought, to hate it, right? So I thought, this is my moment. I'm going for it. So I said to them, oh, no. Didn't you know that traffic is really, really special? <laughs> that it gives us a time that we don't ordinarily have. And, you know, here you are, you're in those comfortable seats, we're in our comfortable seats, and we're just stopped here, and we're all together, and it's quiet, and we get to be together, and we could sing, we could tell stories, you know, we just have this special time together. Traffic is special. 
And I looked at them, and they were kind of looking like you're looking right now. And they, <laughs> and, they, and they looked at me, and then they looked at each other, and they looked back at me, and they said, nah. <laughs> we hate traffic. So I want to begin this audacious message with a quote from Paramahansa Yogananda, who said, the proximity of happiness is as close as one's own self. It isn't even a matter of attaining, but only of lifting the soul-shrouding veil of ignorance. The very word attaining implies something one wants but does not have, which is a metaphysical error. The very word attaining implies something one wants but does not have a metaphysical error. So just as a seed contains the blossom and fruit it will bring forth from itself, so does the soul of every person contain the blossom of spiritual realization and the fruit of supreme happiness that comes from that. So as much as we all desire lasting happiness, happiness that we can have for no reason. It's a mystery that we don't often consider how to attain it or how to know it, how to experience it. I don't think anybody, or at least nobody that I've known, gets up in the morning and says, I am really looking forward to being miserable today. We are all seeking happiness all the time. From, from the moment we get up in the morning to the end of the day, we are looking for it. And in order for us to experience it, I think it must begin with realizing that it's actually possible for us to experience and to know lasting happiness, unconditional happiness. So we, we want to understand the metaphysics of that and get over what Yogananda called the metaphysical error. And then, once we understand the, metaphysic, the metaphysics of it, we, we want to have the willingness to chart our course into those divine vistas of possibility that will open to us. So what I want to share with you today is sort of a little formula about being happy for no reason, how to find lasting happiness, and it takes three things from us. First, it takes a scientific mind. You have to contemplate. How do, how do we actually find that, right? What is the truth of it for us? And it takes a devotional heart. And it takes a fearless attitude. If you're going to be happy no matter what, you better learn how to be fearless. So let's start with scientific mind. That is a mind, of course, that examines. We have inquiry, experimentation. We ask ourselves, well, what is happiness really? And what is my experience of it? What do I know about it? What actually brings us happiness? What actually connects me to my innate joy? And we should ask ourselves, do I think it's actually possible to be unconditionally happy? And would I want that? So lasting unconditional happiness is a matter really of spiritual realization. It's knowing what it is, knowing what the source of it is, where to find it, how to look for it, all of that. And then learning to live from that fullness of divine joy, that bliss which is of the nature of the soul, that is spiritual actualization. So realization is finding the joy that is innate to our very being. And then spiritual actualization is learning how to live it every day, to bring it into our experience and to share it. So first is, you know, what it is and how to look for it. 
where to find it. So we, you know, we, I said we all desire that, but we're not necessarily skillful at how to find it, where to look for it. And most of us, of course, from the very beginning, from our youth, are taught to look outside of ourselves for our happiness, something that we will acquire, um, you know, something that will please us, a new car maybe, a new home, a new pair of shoes. I was envying the red shoes next to me this morning. <laughs> Some advancement in our career, a new romantic group partner. The list is infinite, right, of what we can find out there that will make us happy. Now, I do want to say those things actually do make us happy. Tell the truth. Right? They do. However, the catch is that we need to understand with our scientific mind that none of those things, regardless how great they are and how much happiness they bring us at any given time, they cannot give us lasting happiness because they're all temporary. They're all things that are subject to change. And anything that is subject to change obviously cannot bring us that which lasts, that which is unconditional. A thing can only give us of its nature. So whatever is changing, whatever is conditional, whatever is subject to change cannot give us unchanging happiness. So there is a saying in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, one who is established in contentment experiences supreme happiness or lasting happiness. One who is established in contentment experiences supreme happiness. That is so interesting. Well, it was for me because I, when I came across that teaching, it had me turn my head around because my whole life I had the formula backwards according to the metaphysics of it, which was, I thought, I will do this, I will be that, I will get this, I will attain that, then I will be happy, and once I am happy, I will be content. Made sense to me, that was what I was taught. Get on that path, get this, do that, be that. Happiness is a result. But what we find in the Yoga Sutra is, no, no, no. Actually, contentment is the key. So find the source of happiness within you, which according to the teachings of yoga is bliss. It is the joy of the soul itself, which is unchanging. Find out how to touch that, how to know that. And once you have this contentment within your heart and within your mind, you will find happiness wherever you go because you will take it with you. So that is the basic metaphysics of it. That's what it means by finding it within us, being able to take it with us. Now, I wanted to know, what does that look like in life? And I have met several people, I've been blessed to have known several people in my life who are unconditionally happy, who have remained happy and content in the face of challenge, of gain or loss, whose happiness have, has just shined like a light for those around them. And one person like that, for me, was my beloved Aunt Annabelle, my father's older sister, who um, made her transition from this world just shy of her 102nd birthday. <laughs> and she, she took care of me when I was a baby, and um, I spent a lot of time with her as a child, and I was really nourished by her. This woman is just a light. And even as an adult, she continued to nurture and support and love me, and I just learned so much from her. We had a very special bond. I knew she loved me. 
and she always drew out the best in me. And what I discovered at her memorial service, which was so fascinating, was that everyone felt that way about her, special and loved. Everyone felt that way about her. Because her happiness came from a spiritual sense of well-being, a greater contentment that permeated her life, and then it shone on all of us, and it, it was there in how she related to us. It was a sweet happiness that prevailed like a divine fragrance, you know, that just lifted us all up. She was excited when she turned 100. It was a goal. I remember talking to her, you know, heading towards 100, and she was really looking forward to it because she knew that the local newspaper, she was living in Madeira, California, a little town, right? And she, and she knew that the Madeira Times would come to interview her. The media often ask centenarians, right, what is the secret to long life? What is the secret to a long life? And she was healthy and strong and sharp at 100. So she was practicing what she was going to tell them, and she had her formula ready when they came for the interview with their camera. Do you want to know what she told them? She said three things. One... Eat chocolate every day. <laughs> Two, be happy. Three, love everyone. And she did that. And she passed on that wisdom to me. All of it. And except for the chocolate, she and His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, share a very similar formula for happiness. Now, the Buddha is quoted as saying, there is pleasure and there is bliss. Forego the first to attain the second. Now, I think you have to unpack that one because I... I never believed that the Buddha meant that we should give up pleasure um, because it's actually impossible to do that. You know, life, fortunately, life is full of pleasure. You know, we're thirsty, we get a drink of water, we quench our thirst. That is pleasurable. We have pleasurable experiences every day. That's one of the joys of being fully alive. So what could he have meant by that? Well, I think he meant they're different. Don't confuse them. Don't confuse pleasure and bliss. That's really simple, and that's really helpful to us. If, and because we, we can't find bliss, lasting happiness, in our pursuit of pleasure. So we just need to know the distinction. We can have both, but we should not try to get one from the other where it is not truly available to us. Dalai Lama also said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And if you want to be happy, practice compassion. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And if you want to be happy, practice compassion. So I don't think that my Aunt Annabelle ever read anything by the Dalai Lama. But like all the rest of us, she had the inherent ability to find true happiness. And it turns out that her secret to a long and happy life that she prepared for the Madeira Times <laughs> had some clues in it which is, here we go, there is pleasure. That would be the chocolate. <laughs> pleasure is the happiness that we des derive from sensory experience. And they are 
pleasurable. And they are not permanent or even long-lasting. Even with chocolate, the second bite is not as pleasurable as the first. And the third, by then, is much over. I myself have made a serious scientific investigation into this. And then there is bliss, which is the happiness that lasts, that is rooted in our essence, in the soul, in our essence of being. And that happiness that is of the soul becomes available to us in our daily life, I think through our acts of love and compassion. So we can touch it in meditation, we can know it, but when we want to live it every day, it comes out through our love and compassion. Now, Aunt Annabelle told me that at some point in her life, she made a decision to be happy. It was a conscious choice. She told me that. She said, I just decided I was going to be happy, and she was going to choose it. So how? So depends on our, our scientific mind to know how to do it, and then our devotional heart. And that's how she actualized that. She decided she would be happy, and then she discovered the secret to actually being happy, to actually living it every day. And that decision was to love everyone. She was going to love everyone no matter what. She's about this tall, too. She's just ferociously going to love everyone no matter what. That was going to be her mission in life. And as far as I know, from what I saw in her, what I experienced from her, she succeeded. She discovered the secret to actually being happy. And you know, we could say she embarked on putting into practice that greatest commandment, right? To love the Lord, the God, with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and our neighbor as herself. She had put it into practice. So we can all use our scientific mind and our devotional heart to reflect on what has brought us the greatest happiness and how we can embark on that journey of happiness every day of our life. And I think Annabelle's mm, success with this unconditional happiness is that she, she did not, she decided to be happy but she didn't tie it to her personal happiness. She decided to be happy. She decided she would love everyone. That was her methodology. And so her personal happiness came as a byproduct. It came naturally out of the soul's joy. It blossomed, and it bore the fruit of happiness. And so she was like a pole star in that way. Beautiful, beautiful pole star. So, scientific mind, discover there's, there's hues of happiness. There's pleasure. There's delight. There's happiness that we attain when we're successful. And there's bliss, bliss of the soul. So we use our contemplation, we use our ability to discern the nature of happiness itself. Don't you wish this was taught in schools? Let's teach the kids about the nature of happiness. So scientific mind, devotional heart. So for her, it was that decision to be happy and what was connected to it that she would love everyone. And then the third thing I want to 
offer you this morning in this message of how to be happy for no reason is that I think being truly happy, having a truly happy life, requires a fearless attitude. A fearless attitude. There's just a willingness to say, yes, I have this commitment to live this truth of my being regardless of outer circumstances. It takes a commitment, doesn't it, to remain in divine love, to remain even-minded in times of loss and gain, to remain anchored in our divine joy. It takes a certain vigilance, too, to make sure that we are not letting other people or circumstances rob our inherent joy. We're in charge of that. That's up to us. And all the time, that's in motion. So you have to have a fearless commitment to be anchored in that joy that is your joy and to take responsibility for it, to do what we need to do to return to love, to return to joy all the time. No one else can do that for us. We have to do it for ourselves. I think about um, the singer Shirley Caesar, who had the song, maybe it's one you've done here before, This Joy I Have, you know that one? This Joy I Have, the world didn't give it to me. I should be able to sing a few bars for you. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. <laughs> So I want to close with a little reading here. Neither austerity nor luxury brings lasting happiness. Neither austerity nor luxury brings lasting happiness. The wealth of an awakened heart full of divine love is the only currency that provides enduring joy. The wealth of an awakened heart full of divine love is the only currency that provides enduring joy. Awaken each day to the song of divine remembrance ever singing in your soul. Greet the dawn with the colors of your own magnificence. Step out into the day with the vitality that flows from the radiant source of your being. Don't hold back. Let your light shine. Go ahead. Be happy for no reason. Namaste. <laughs>